It's a funny place to be, stuck in a seemingly mundane world with an inner knowing that the universe is so much more than our mortal minds can comprehend. Yet we all have the capacity to know peace and our oneness with the wholeness of life. And through these interviews, discussions, and reflections, it is my intention to share this possibility. I'm Ryan Kurzak, and this is the Kriya Yoga Podcast. So fantastic. We can go ahead and get started with this first episode of the Kriya Yoga Podcast. And in this episode, we're going to start at the beginning, at least in the beginning as far as human history knows at this point in time. And we're going to look at the myth and the legends related to Kriya Yoga, primarily by reviewing the lives of the Kriya Yoga teachers in this current era. Now, the teachers we're going to focus on are Maha Avatar Babaji, Lahiri Mahasaya, Sri Yukteswar, Paramahansa Yogananda, and Roy Eugene Davis. Now, this is the teaching lineage uh, that I know and that I am a part of. And there are branches to this, just like there's a family tree. Because typically, the way it's supposed to function, as far as I understand, is that when an individual has, has learned to practice meditation well, has learned to embody uh, the life and the inner knowing of this idea of self-realization, um, they're then able to share that knowledge with others. And so teachers have students. And in this lineage, this is going from one teacher to the next, but each of those teachers have had multiple students. So, for example, uh, Lahiri Mahasaya, his only student was not simply Sri Yukteswar. Uh, he had other students which were also authorized to teach Kriya Yoga. And just like Sri Yukteswar had other students than Paramahansa Yogananda, Paramahansa Yogananda had other students than uh, Roy Eugene Davis, and Roy Eugene Davis has ordained many ministers through his organization, Center for Spiritual Awareness, while he was alive, to also teach and share this information. So we need to keep in mind that while we're focusing on this particular line of the lineage, um, that this is really more so a, a family tree than anything else, uh, peripherally in the bigger picture. And the reason I, I use the term myth and legend is because the beginning of this tradition in regards to how it was shared with the public essentially began with Paramahansa Yogananda coming to the West and the writing of his book, Autobiography of a Yogi. And in that book, he speaks of Maha Avatar Babaji and all the wondrous things that Maha Avatar Babaji is able to do and what he shared with his student, Lahiri Mahasaya. Um, it's good to understand these myths. It's good to understand these legends because it helps to give us the capacity to outgrow our normal, limited human mind, essentially. So we're going to begin with Maha Avatar Babaji. Now, Babaji, the name itself, Babaji, Baba means father, and G at the end, uh, that denotes reverence or respect. So Babaji is said to be an illumined master whose name means a reverend father or holy father. Now, little is known about Babaji, again, beyond what has been written in Autobiography of a Yogi. Now, several people throughout time since then have talked about meeting Babaji, having experiences with Babaji. Um, I have not gone too deeply into exploring those things. So whether they are true or not, I cannot say. However, I do remember Mr. Davis at a retreat one time discussing how Paramahansa Yogananda himself said that um, after he passed, he would not engage in things like channeling or coming through channels or mediums and psychics and these sorts of things. And Mr. Davis had told this story how not very long after 
uh, Paramahansa Yogananda had passed, a few years after he had passed, uh, Mr. Davis was teaching Kriya Yoga, and someone came up to him and told him that they have someone they'd like him to meet. And the way it all kind of shook out was he eventually went and met this person, and they said that they were channeling Paramahansa Yogananda, and Paramahansa Yogananda had messages for him, if I recall the story correctly. And Roy recalled Paramahansa Yogananda saying that he would not do that. So we always have to be cautious when we hear stories <laughs> of having experiences with divine masters who are past. Um, so keep this in mind as we proceed. But it is important to understand the history of where Babaji fits in this whole process. So Babaji, he began the reintroduction of Kriya Yoga. Um, Babaji is said to work behind the scenes. He's not interested in being well-known, in having large followings. The idea is that the clarity of his consciousness, he meditates, exists to infuse that into planetary consciousness. And this is a very important thing to keep in mind because the greatest yogi in this tradition, as far as we understand it, is Maha Avatar Babaji. And it is his intention to work behind the scenes to uplift humanity and human consciousness. And he does that by existing in the state of clarity, in the clearest state that he is able to. And this is important because it is, a, it is an example for all of us to recognize that by attending to our own meditation, to our own inner peace and well-being and understanding of how we are the wholeness of life and are connected to the wholeness of life, that that is profoundly transformational. I can remember reading about a sage whom you may have heard of, Ramana Maharshi, who was asked one time why he was not more active in the world uh, in the way Gandhi was more active in the world with social justice and um, taking upon himself the duties of trying to change society through various kinds of activity in the world. And Ramana Maharshi said, well, how do you, how do you know I'm not being helpful in this regard? How do you know I'm not acting like Gandhi is acting? And many people misunderstood that, but again, what he was trying to share was that by simply doing his best, and he didn't really have to do his best, it was just innate and natural to him, to embody that state of clarity, state of self-realization that yoga is meant to engender in us, that that changes the world, that changes the planet. And if you're perceptive, you'll notice that, that the clearer you get, the calmer you get when you're in family situations that are tense, when you're in work situations that are difficult, when you are in any kind of situation where there's something problematic happening, uh, your inner peace and calm assists the resolution of that situation. And that, that is the most important service that we all have to render in this world. So Babaji is an excellent example of that by being such a profound figure in this tradition and choosing to work behind the scenes to focus on clarifying consciousness internally rather than directing it uh, in some form of um, external activity. So Babaji's role is to inspire people who are actively nurturing planetary consciousness and uplifting humanity and ministering directly to seekers on the spiritual path. And so there will be times when you have moments of clarity, moments of extreme well-being when you're meditating, where you just understand certain things. And the myth and the legend would indicate that it may be that this is a type of interaction with Babaji. You know, I can remember a particular meditation session where 
of simply sitting as I did every day. And most of my meditations are not very profound in the sense of fantastic things happening. But I can remember this particular session where I was sitting there and I was just gazing off into the distance of my closed eyelids as though the blackness of my uh, my closed eyes was an infinite space. And as everything got calm and as I was able to forget about my little sense of self, this radiant light appeared. And I remember seeing an image of, of a brilliant figure. Uh, and it was just for an instant. But that flash sort of changed the traje trajectory of my whole day. And it's moments like that, that maybe they're a brain-produced phenomena, or maybe it is a brief glimpse, a brief communication, a brief blessing from one of these individual, immortal, reverend father yogis like Babaji. So it's possible. Uh, but Babaji is acknowledged as the, as the spiritual head of the current Kriya Yoga tradition. However, we need to remember that Babaji is not limited to this particular Enlightenment tradition. No great teachers are really limited to any particular tradition. Um, we just say that we are related to the Kriya Yoga tradition and so on, just to kind of make it easier for filing away concepts in our mind. But Babaji is not limited to any particular Enlightenment movement in the same way that the idea of the Christ consciousness is not limited simply to Christianity. When we dig deep, when we dig deep into most authentic spiritual traditions, we will find that the principles, the methodologies, the states of consciousness that one arrives at should they apply those practices of the tradition it tends to result in the same kind of clarity of consciousness. Uh, so Babaji is simply a conduit for this particular Kriya Yoga tradition. Now it's said that Babaji has been in his present form for several centuries. Um, he's also been known by different names in different times and places. Swami Kebalananda, who was disciple of Lahiri Mahasaya, um, he was told that Babaji had even initiated Shankara, and Shankara lived over a thousand years earlier. Now Lahiri mentioned that, or at least he had told a few disciples, that he had remembered a previous incarnation when he was known as Kabir. Kabir. Now, Kabir was a poet saint, and Kabir lived between 1440 and 1518 AD, and he extolled surrender to the guru, to the guru within, and to the practices of meditation on inner sound and light. Uh, Kabir was also said to have been initiated by Babaji. Now, meditation on inner sound and light is also a practice in the Kriya Yoga tradition. Um, those of you who've already been initiated and know the basic procedures, um, Jyoti Mudra, Jyoti Mudra, which is the third major procedure um, that you learn during initiation, helps you see inner light and learn to meditate on that inner light. Now we have to remember that avatars such as Babaji, that they play roles according to the current needs of the planet and the current needs of human consciousness. Um, Babaji's role is said to be that of the avatar Shiva. And the mission, Babaji's mission, is to enliven planetary consciousness during the present transition from the Dark Age to the Age of Enlightenment. Now, the Age of Enlightenment is quite a few thousand years in the future. And this will be something, again, that we talk about um, in future episodes of this podcast. More than likely, I'll focus on after we get through exploring the lives of the Kriya Yoga teachers. But there are different ages that human consciousness and planetary consciousness goes through. And this is spoken of in Sri Yukteswar's book, The Holy Science. Um, there are the Dark Ages, then the Electric Age, then what we call the Silver Age or the Mental Age. And then it moves into the Golden Age. And this is a circle that we go on. 
And in each age, human consciousness resonates at a certain level. And so right now, right now, we have passed out of the dark ages and we're in the end of that dawning period of the electric age. That is why over the last 200 years, last 100 years, last 50 years, we've seen such an explosion of understanding related to science, technology, electricity, electromagnetism, um, physics. All of this comes because we're transitioning from the dark age towards the age of enlightenment. And of course, the, the age in between that we're at right now is the electric age. And so Babaji's role is that of an avatar of Shiva to aid in the transition from the Dark Age to the Age of Enlightenment. And why Shiva? Well, Shiva is, a, is an aspect of consciousness, a power of divine consciousness related to transition and change. That's why Shiva can be related to destruction and even the idea of death because these are necessary things to move to a new stage of awareness, a new stage of existence. And so this is Babaji's role. Um, it is said that he is influential in accelerating the awakening of the multitudes to spiritual values, and that Babaji works to help neutralize the stress caused by the actions of misguided individuals and in materialistic societies. So when you are identified with the small self, the little ego, all you tend to think about is what are you going to eat? Who's taking your food? Do I have enough money? Do I have more than the next person? Am I going to be able to have sex tonight? You're, there's a real focus on these, these extreme bodily needs. And when you're identified with your personality and your body and this small sense of self, you tend to do things in the world and in society which promote stress, which promote difficulty, because you can't see the bigger picture. So Babaji's role is to help neutralize that stress of those who can't quite see the bigger picture just yet. So he's here to assist evolutionary trends so they can continue on a steady course. Now, up into the 1900s, Babaji was said to have resided in northern India uh, in the Himalayan mountains near Bajranarayan, and this is not far from the border of Nepal. So the region of the Drungari Mountains in Autumn of 1861, this is when Babaji initiated Lahiri Mahasaya into Kriya Yoga practices. So the Drungiri, excuse me, the Drungiri Mountains during the autumn of 1861, Babaji initiated Lahiri Mahasaya into the Kriya Yoga practices and counseled him to return to society and teach others the sacred science. So Lahiri Mahasaya stayed with Babaji for two weeks and said that he witnessed many miracles. And again, you can refer to Autobiography of a Yogi to get some insights into this. In 1893, in 1893, there was a Kumbh Mela. And this is a major religious gathering um, that occurs in India for the purpose of bringing together saints and truth sinkers. Um, so in 1893, where the Ganges, the Jumna, and the now extinct Saraswati rivers come together, Babaji then met Sri Yukteswar. And it was at this time that Babaji asked Sri Yukteswar to write the book revealing the underlying unity of religions. So as you know, as we've discussed, all religions, all spiritual practices, all spiritual traditions have an underlying unity. And so by asking Sri Yukteswar to write this book, this was one way that Babaji was directly trying to encourage um, the evolution of this consciousness to go beyond tribalism, to go beyond the sense of separateness, to go beyond the wars that tear people apart because they think they have the right belief system, how families are torn apart because uh, one side of the family thinks that uh, you have to follow this particular tradition, this particular path, and so harmony is, is 
disturbed and no one's happy. And that's not very good. So this was just one effort to try to bring about a greater sense of unity. And we can all do this. Um, on your own, the best way to do it is to simply be patient with everyone. Um, if you know that there is an underlying unity to spiritual traditions and you meet individuals who want to tell you how theirs is the best or how you're doing it wrong, <laughs> if, if you are practicing well and you are meditating well and you have a greater sense of clarity, a greater sense of inner peace, a greater sense of resilience, you can deal with life better, you, you have a greater appreciation for um, the beauty of nature and the, the love between peoples, you're just fine. So you, you, you're able to tap into more patience to let people say and do whatever they want and remain as best you can in a loving state, in a loving presence. By you doing that, you don't have to argue. You don't have to get involved in their philosophy. You don't have to challenge them. You just simply let them say, do, and be whatever they want, again, assuming that they're not um, outwardly disrespecting you or harming you. <laughs> Um, in those situations, it's probably best to remove yourself from the situation or defend yourself. Um, but most of the time, maintaining as best we can some kind of loving presence and inner peace while holding patience for others, um, this is one way that we can help to recognize unity between us all. But back to the point. Um, Shri Kishwar was asked to write this book, The Holy Science, with the underlying idea of revealing the unity of religions, it's also in the holy science that uh, Sri Kishwar describes the yugas or the, the great cycles of time where human consciousness evolves and devolves. Um, so we'll talk about that in a future episode. Aside from simply sharing the inspiration to write the holy science, Babaji also told Sri Yukteswar that a few years later that he would send him a disciple who is to be trained to take the message of yoga to the West. So he told Sri Yukteswar, soon I will send you a disciple, a student, because that's what the word disciple means. It's simply a learner or a student. Uh, I will send you a student who you will train to take the message of yoga to the West. And that disciple was Paramahansa Yogananda. Now, as the story goes, again, part of the myth and the legend is that many disciples, many students of Lahiri Mahasaya were also said to have had personal contact with Babaji over the years in the Himalayas. Uh, it was said that Babaji would visit them in a subtle form. It said that Babaji can appear to persons in his light body and can dematerialize and materialize his physical body at will. I do believe, for, it's been a while since I've read Autobiography of a Yogi, but I do believe that there is a story in Autobiography of a Yogi where Babaji visits, I th I'm pretty sure it was Sri Yukteswar again, um, and he, he materialized out of a, beams of sunlight and essentially Babaji says that Sri Yukteswar was able to see him because his mind was quiet enough to go beyond all the distractions all the noise to to allow the ability to perceive Babaji's form I suppose metaphysically but enough that he could perceive it. And so that is an important thing to remember, and again, we'll speak to this a little later on, that this being that we know as Babaji, the light that Babaji represents is within all of us. And if we're able to let go of our attachment to the small sense of self, the mind, the body, the personality, the likes, the dislikes, and we're able to rest in pure awareness, if we're resting in pure awareness, that is the nature of this legendary figure, Babaji. And if we're able to 
appreciate and experience pure awareness beyond the small sense of self, we are essentially appreciating Babaji. If it is to our benefit or if it is part of our destiny to see and know a form that we associate with Babaji, the being Babaji, we will. If we're not meant to do that, if we're simply destined to learn to appreciate and exist in pure awareness, pure consciousness, pure being, that is the same thing. So we don't want to confuse we don't want to confuse um, seeing or knowing a form with success. Because part of this whole process is learning to let go of attachment to form and specifics and personal preferences. But we can go into that a little more deeply in a later episode. Um, some titles that are given to Babaji. Mahamuni Baba, Supreme Ecstatic Master. Mahayogi, the great yogi. Trumbuk Baba or Shiva Baba. And again, titles denoting avatars of Shiva. Some have said that more recent appearances, at least until the second decade of the 21st century, uh, more recent appearances could be connected with a saint known as Harayakan Baba. And the reason he was called Harayakan Baba was because he frequented a vicinity where um, Maro, Marobalan um, grew. He chose this as a temporary abode. Um, this master was also said to have arrived in a small village called Harayakan in the Nainital district and settled there around 1894. Um, no one knew who he was or from where he had journeyed, and because of the style of his dress and the fact that he spoke a mixture of, let's see if I can pronounce this correctly, uh, Kama Oni Pahari and Nepali Doti, he was considered to have come from Nepal. Um, when they looked at his handwriting, it revealed a mixture of Pali and Tibetan characters, and his age was unknown. So this is in reference to uh, Harayakan Baba and the idea that Harayakan Baba was also said to be Maha Avatar Babaji. Um, Harayakan Baba was said to often be observed wrapped in immense peace and calm during extended occasions of meditation and samadhi. It said that wherever he went, people flocked for his blessings. Now, it was also said that Harayakan Baba was a strict disciplinarian and possessed yogic powers, which he would use to bring good fortune to people and to heal many of their ailments. It said that he restored sight to the blind, revived persons who were near death. He could control the elements. It was said that he could ride the air and sometimes quickly traverse great distances. He was also known to appear in two or more places at the same time. Um, when Lahiri Mahasaya was with Babaji decades before, he reported that those close to the master often did not have to prepare meals. Babaji would simply point to a container, and whatever food that, that disciple or student desired would materialize there. So again, if you've read Autobiography of a Yogi, many of these powers were described um, by various saints and sages that Paramahansa Yogananda had met. Um, Harayakan Baba encouraged public ceremonies for the welfare of people so that they could have harmonious relationships with the forces of nature. Now, this is important because Many of you know that I am a Vedic astrologer, or have been a Vedic astrologer, and Sri Yukteswar was a Vedic astrologer. And in my mind, the current state of Vedic astrology is not quite um, 
I would say it's more dark age astrology because currently Vedic astrology, like most astrology, seems to be practiced to speak to the personality in the individual. And astrology, from what I can gather and my own inner meditations, contemplations, leads me to believe that the original astrology wasn't meant to have someone tell you all about your fortunes and your finances and your future and who you're going to marry and so on. It was meant to help individuals live in harmony with the forces of nature while they're here in this body, in this world. So that's why you would use astrology to figure out, is it a good time to plant? Is it a good time to commit to another individual? Is it, another, is it a good time to perform this deed? Why? Because you want to know if the cosmic weather patterns are appropriate for that particular action. And as you know, it's better to plant seeds and fruits when nature is supportive of them growing well. You don't go and plant seeds and fruits in the harshest winter when you know they're not going to grow and the seeds are just going to freeze and die. So having ceremonies and even festivals, um, holidays, many of these were meant to keep, keep us in harmony with the forces of nature so that we can live the the best life possible here in this world while we have a human body because this human body is built of the forces of nature is fed by the sun ultimately is nourished by the waters of the planet so having ceremonies which encourage people to be in harmonious relationship with the forces of nature this is a good thing um, if a student would ask for help in a personal problem um, the saint would say, your wish will be fulfilled if you sincerely rely upon God. So again, despite these powers that were listed here of this um, person associated, related to, said to be, Maha Avatar Babaji, there was not a focus on the powers. There was a focus on sincerely relying upon that inner grace. Now, before leaving the area, and this was during the early years of the second decade of the 20th century, uh, Harayak and Baba toured several of the Himalayan areas, and he concluded his travels at the border town, uh, again, hopefully I'll pronounce this correctly, of Escot. Maybe it's Escote, but I think it's probably Escot. Um, he bid farewell to those who accompanied him, and he crossed over the river to Nepal, now, while in the Himalayas, he established several ashrams, which are said to be used to this day. And some of some of them are located in Katgarya, Shitlaket, and Nainatal. Now, I don't have a copy of Maha Avatar Babaji and the Garden of Faith with me. I'll have to dig that up. But anyway, at... At Babaji's physical departure, again, Harayak and Baba, as Babaji, there's that connection there. At his physical departure, um, it was said that he was occasionally seen in his subtle form and moving as a mass of light during special public holidays and occasions. Lahiri Masaya, Shrikshwar, Paramahansa, Yogananda would tell students not to try to travel to the Himalayas to attempt to meet Babaji, but to deepen their meditation and learn to commune with him on inner levels of awareness. It's said of Babaji's protective influence. Um, Paramahansa Yogananda told disciples that if they were faithful to their spiritual practices, when they made their transition, Babaji or at least one of the gurus or teachers in the lineage would be present to usher them into the infinite. This is very important. With our own spiritual practice, we don't want to get hung up on a physical form or ideal of a teacher's body, mind, or personality. That body, mind, of personality and time and space is there to assist us while we are also in this mind, body, personality situation. It's to assist us to recognize our own inner, eternal, immortal, timeless essence. Now the reason 
it said that if we are attentive to our spiritual practices, that we will be ushered into the in, infinite um, at our transition. Well, it's because if we are attentive to our own spiritual practices, we are growing accustomed to recognizing that we are not the mind, the body, that we are an infinite, eternal, timeless being that is shared by all people, by all enlightened masters. And then if we can recognize that now, then when it's time to leave the body, no big deal. We can let it go and we can flow our awareness into a state that is free of attachment to this form that rises and falls, the form that was born, the form that will die, the body that was born, the body that will die. And it reminds me again, you've heard me tell this if you've um, listened to any of my other lectures, it reminds me again of the story that Roy Davis told, and I believe it was at the very first Kriya Yoga Congress in San Jose, California. Maybe that was 2007. It's been a while. I don't remember. Um, but someone had sent him a question asking, how can I know that at the time of transition, when I leave my body, that I will be awake, that I will be free, that I will merge in God and divine consciousness? And again, there's the idea that if an individual who practices yoga brings their awareness up to the crown chakra or the spiritual eye center at the time of departure, transition from the body, that they will be released into um, free and clear awareness. And what Mr. Davis said was, he said, well, I got this question and all I could write back, all I could say to this individual is, the only way you'll know that you're going to be completely free and able to merge in the infinite when you transition, when you leave the body, is to do it now, to, to, to know, to, to be able to uh, be enlightened and clear and aware of the truth of your being before you go, before you transition, before you die. That's the only way that you can know that that's really what's going to happen. So that is, again, why... Uh, paying attention to our spiritual practice, studying, trying to understand the Yoga Sutras, the Bhagavad Gita, doing our best to listen to those who've come before us who maybe had a little more experience than us and trying to understand what they understand. By doing that faithfully, that will lead to a direct experience of the realization of what you are. And then that will be permanent whether you've got a body or whether you don't have a body. And if you're able to know that through your practice, then you know what Babaji knows. You know what Babaji is. You recognize your relationship to Babaji. You know that that inner light, that inner being, that inner awareness that is able to conceive and, and perceive and understand and think about this idea of, of Babaji, you know that that is Babaji and that you are one in the same. Now, this is not meant to lead you to grandiose ideas or to um, fantasy about how great you are, because that's not what results. <laughs> that's not the result of that kind of realization. Um, it, it's to recognize and awaken in you the truth of your innate nature. And so when I meditate... You know, in the very beginning, I would have uh, pictures, images of the gurus of the tradition. And this is when I first got started meditating, so this was my inspiration. And I would think about those teachers, and I would imagine a, a connection with them as though um, I was able to accept their blessings in a way. But as time went on, that transformed it was about five years after I began practicing Kriya Yoga to when I would think about the teachers of the tradition, Babaji, Lahiri Masaya, Sri Yukteswar, Paramahansa Yogananda, Roy Eugene Davis, and I was lucky to have had quite a lot of interaction with Mr. Davis. Um, every time 
we would go to CSA. We'd spend minimum of an hour and a half to two hours with them, just simply drinking tea and talking. And um, after we had moved to Asheville, North Carolina, I would often meet with him uh, once a month in that way. And I spent about 10 years in Asheville uh, with my late wife, Melissa Baker. Um, but what I would do in, in, before I would, I would get deeply into meditation is I would hold in my mind the sense that that inner light that is them, that I perceive as them, is also the inner light in me, in my heart, in my awareness. And I would let that set the tone for the meditation practice. That was my way of attuning to this lineage. And when I see people in the world, uh, I do my best, no matter who they are, whether I like them or I don't like them, whether they're um, pleasant to be around or unpleasant to be around, I do my best at some point in time to see that same light in them because it is in them, whether they're aware of it or not. So this is this is how we can, without fantasy and with great benefit, learn to attune to the gurus of this tradition. I'll probably bring this up over and over again because it's something I, I don't think can be said enough. Um, but anyway, I think this is enough digging into the legend and myth of Kriya Yoga at the moment, uh, looking at the life of Maha Avatar Babaji, the little we do know. Uh, in our next episode, we'll explore, consider the life of Lahiri Mahasaya, a student of Maha Avatar Babaji and teacher to Sri Yukteswar. <laughs>